Get ready. We're going to see how you do finding things in the Bible. So open your Bible. You ready? Don't, don't start yet. Open your Bibles to Genesis. We're going to keep, we're going to start with, we're going to keep the first rung on the ladder kind of low. We'll pick up from there, but Genesis. Ready? Go. Okay, now we're going to chapter 12 of Genesis. So I hope you can find your way to chapter 12 of Genesis. Genesis is the first book in your Bible. We're going to keep practicing this because we want to make the, the Old Testament more accessible. Next week, just so you can start studying now to get ready to find it quickly, the next sermon, Exodus. So be looking in your Bible, study where Exodus is, and you ought to be able to find your way there rather quickly, okay? We're walking through, and we want to make this this big part of God's Word, these 39 books in the Old Testament, we want to make it accessible, understandable, and to see the big picture of how the flow of this story goes. And I want to start out with this first because uh, this is one of those things that can be a hitch in understanding how to interpret the Bible, and it is this, that we, we have, and because I live in the United States of America, I have an American mindset about a lot of things culturally. Now, we have... A, more and more in our church, we have people from all over the world who attend our church, and some of your cultures that you come from much better mirror the worldview of, a, of, of the Bible. American culture is, is very individualistic. It's about me and mine, and the biblical record is, is more about community and about extended family. It's just a different way of thinking about the world, and so we're big on me and God. The Old Testament especially, we find the New Testament too, is a whole lot more we and God. And because of that, we have difficulty interpreting a lot of things that the Bible says and how the big picture flows. Because we think of the Bible, we say, well, it's uh, Adam and Eve and God. And it's Abraham and God. And it's Moses and God. And it's David and God. Well, it is. There's always an individual application, but the big picture of Scripture is very communal, not individualistic. And so we're going to have some troubles with some of the things interpreting the Bible and ap applying the, God's Word in the Old Testament when, uh, we get the, get, when we don't get past the me and God to get to the we and God. It's about us together. It's about a journey we do together. Now, we're not good at this, and I came across this in some reading a few years ago. It's really helpful to me, and so I want to share things I'm trying to learn. And uh, we're not good at it when it comes to Bible, but we're, we're good at it when it comes to business. So we're going to put this in a business context, and you can see how this plays out and how really it should play out in interpreting the Old Testament. So here we go. Consider what, you're ha what happens when you're hired by a company, Okay. You're hired by a company. They give you a box of business cards. has your name. It has a company logo. They may give you a company shirt. has the company logo on it. And from that day forward, you're expected to become the face of the company to the world. Okay? You're representing the company. It's not just you. It's the company. And if you do a bad job, the company's reputation suffers. And you will suffer. But ultimately, your fate is tied to the company. If it prospers, you prosper. If it fails, you fail. But you're a part of something bigger than yourself. It's not just about you. It's about the company. And we'd better relate to a biblical worldview if we saw, uh, maybe kept our corporate hat on for a little bit longer. Uh, think of this. We got Abraham here, and he's launching out. And there's a big shift. When you get to chapter 11, and you move into chapter 12 of Genesis, there's a big shift in the story. And really, the sermons, I'm not going to cover the whole Old Testament in six weeks, but I'm going to cover the pivot points when things shift. And this is one of those times when it all shifts. So think about it this way. There's this guy, and his name is Abraham. And God tells him one day his family business is going to transform the world. So he's Abraham Incorporated, Abraham Inc., He's a, it's a partnership between God and Abraham's family, and it's designed to publicize the owner of the company, the divine owner, and his grand vision for the world, uh, holiness and justice for all. Okay? 
God promised Abraham that one day this family business would transform the world, and it's really hard to imagine that this little mom-and-pop enterprise would be able to transform the world, partly because it's a dog-eat-dog corporate world out there that he's dealing with. Yeah, these massive conglomerates. I mean, he's a mom-and-pop operation. Massive conglomerate. You got Egypt Megacorp, Babylon Multinational. Later on, they're going to go up against Rome uh, Unlimited. There's a lot of competition just in the market that they're in. You have these Philistines. that They just have better technology, and it's hard to be competitive when the competition locally has better technology than you do. They're always threatening to take over the company. As you follow the story, you see more problems arise, because as can be the case in a lot of workplaces, internal strife, struggle, disagreement. You have uh, corruption in management. The employees of the company often look around them and say, I think we could make this more sellable to everybody else if we just change the mission and vision statement a little bit. Not just throwing it away, but shifting the focus just, just a bit to make it a little more accessible and agreeable to the local population so that we can be more competitive in the business. Eventually, God insists on a corporate purge. Finally, God, the deity owner, promises to send his own son to take charge as CEO, to return the company to the original vision, to the pure mission that God has always desired. And we see that playing out in the New Testament. So as individualists, we find a lot of the Bible to be confusing and difficult because we don't think in terms of the corporation, uh, of the kingdom of God, or the family of faith started with Abraham. We see it in terms of just you know me and God. And so things that, are, things that are found in the Bible don't make sense to us because of that stuff. This is a sidebar to everything else I'm about to tell you, but I want to get this out there to help you understand the Old Testament better, and I hope that this clarifies a little bit of something. It is not unusual that critics of God's Word, and it's always fascinates me that people say, I don't believe the Bible, I don't believe anything about God or anything else, but they want to argue with you about what the Bible says. Oh, why do you even care? You're going to hell anyway, right? Uh, why, why are you worried about that? Well, first of all, they'd say, well, you say there's a hell, but the Bible also says you're not supposed to wear clothes that are made of both wool and linen, but you do that. Have you ever heard that argument? It's one of, like, judge not lest you be judged, which is the most misunderstood verse in the pagan world, but they love to quote it. They don't know what it means, and they misapply it over and over again, but they, they love to quote it. They also love the verse in the Old Testament from Exodus about don't wear cloth, that has both wool and linen in it. They love that verse. Like they must put it on their mirror at home and dashboard of their car. They love that verse. You don't do that. You've heard it. Well, you say Jesus is the only way to heaven, but you, your Bible that you say you believe in so much also says you shouldn't wear wool and linen clothing. Oh, yeah, you say this is what the Bible says about marriage. And this is where we've heard it most often recently, but the Bible also says you can't wear wool and linen clo mixed clothing. So, ha ha, I've just proved your whole worldview, right? So, why is this? And how does that crazy verse relate to me? If it's just me and God, I guess I have to go back to the store and read labels more closely. But when it's a we and God, it makes a whole lot more sense. Because if you'll read the we and God story, not just an isolated verse, you know, we like to cherry pick. The world loves cherry pick verses. But what if you read the whole story and you see the whole context and you see the community of faith? It's a community of faith command. Because there's one time when God specifies wool and linen are going to go into the priestly garments and all those curtains that divide up the, port, the different pieces of the tabernacle. Tabernacle, that portable place of worship that God instructs Moses to to, to uh, construct, and it's the, it's the focal point for worship things. It's all their priestly garments. That is made of wool and linen cloth. And the reason it's a command is because God says there's a certain way. There, there are things that are of God and things that are not of God. 
We talk things that are clean and unclean. And God says, I just want to know that you're going to worship me the way I have prescribed for you to worship me. Not just do whatever you want to. Not define relationship with me as whatever works for me. God ought to be good with it. But there's a right way to have a relationship to God. It's not just anything that you want it to be. Another place this shows up. So you don't, you don't, uh, you don't, do, you don't do it that way. You, you don't wear what the priests wear. You, you don't. Because that, that is the set-apartedness of relationship to God. And that's how God wants it done. There are things that are, that are of God. There's a way God says to worship Him, to relate to Him, to know Him. Another time later on, and I came across this in my reading this morning, that God prescribes. There's a way to make the holy anointing oil that's going to be used to, to set aside the place of worship, to set aside and ordain the the leaders of worship and that holy anointing oil you don't just pass that around to everybody you don't just go make up your own stuff over at your house but it's it's the special stuff there's a certain way you do things and here's the thing these folks when all the like those those two laws show up they've come out of a polytheistic egyptian world where everybody just does what is right in their own eyes they they worship any way they want to they worship any god they want to they make up the rules and expect that God's going to say, well, thanks for something. And a lot of people do the same thing today. The Bible has all kinds of things about how to relate to God. And we say, well, no, I'm going to do it this way because see, it's about me, not we. But the community of faith, there's a certain way that you do what you do. You don't do your private, do-it-yourself kind of shrines and sacrifices. You don't pretend, put on your priestly garments. It's like uh, we have some of this today. So I drive around Allen, Texas on a regular basis in my little car. You know what? There are people who shouldn't drive in Allen, Texas. I'd like to think I'm not one of those people, Mr. Magoo and around that I do. But I thought, you know, I should just, I should get my, I go down to the costume store and get myself a policeman uniform and a badge and I start pulling people over. I could straighten this place out. Give me about a month. I'd straighten out Allen, Texas and the driving habits of some of you people. Well, you know what? There are things that policemen can do. And it's illegal for me to do that. Because they can pull people over. They can kick down a door. They can put somebody in handcuffs. They're going to frown on me doing that. I'm not going to impersonate a police officer. And what God says is, there's certain things that it's not just me and God and what works for me. It's we and God. There's a community here. There's, there's a communal experience in relationship to God and what we do as the community of faith walk in a relationship to God there's a, there's a pattern for what it's supposed to look like and it can't be just anything you want it to be so that's why some of those laws start showing up so this is going to we're going to carry this through because we're going to have a, a story here about Abraham that starts this pattern of community we and God a people of God not just a me and God now I'd like to begin Okay, and I told you, Genesis 12, but I'm going to throw you a curve. So get ready, get your Bible ready. We're going to a different chapter, okay? Genesis chapter 11. Go. Okay, you should be there by now. Here's, here's what uh, it says in Genesis 11, verse 27, because this is the pace for everything that's about to happen in chapter 12. These are the family records this is one of those places. It's one of those crazy genealogies. We're coming out of it. And there's a reason these genealogies are here. Because they tell a story. These are the family records of Terah. Terah fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in his native land, in Ur of the Chaldeans, during his father Terah's lifetime. Abram and Nahor took wives. Abram's wife was Sarai. Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran and the mother of both Milcah and uh, Iscah. Sarai, she's not Sarah yet, but there's about a 50-50 chance I'll say Sarah before we're done this morning. Sarai was unable to conceive. She did not have a child. They're pretty far along in life still uh, without a child. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, Haran's son, his daughter-in-law, Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they set out together from Ur. 
of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. And Terah lived 205 years and died in Haran. Now, that's a whole lot of crazy names that you don't have any children by most of those names. But here's the, uh, here's the thing to consider. There's a big break between that and chapter 12, verse 1, which begins, the Lord said to Abram. Man, I'm glad that there's a chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram. I want you to notice what we've got in chapter 11. It's the story of everything that's happened since Genesis 3 when sin enters the world. Sin enters the world. Adam and Eve are given one rule in the Garden of Eden, and they break the rule, and they're cast out of the garden, and we see the consequences and the brokenness and the waywardness of sin, and it continues through the rest of Genesis on to chapter 11. And we get to chapter 11, and what do you have? Barrenness, brokenness, loss of purpose. This family, they are stuck. They had a plan, and it just unraveled on them. Everything is going bad. They stop short of their goal. Her- Terah dies in Haran. And it's the story. Just a, That's what sin does to the world. Nothing is right. Nothing's working. Nothing's moving. And for a whole lot of people, and maybe it's your story just now, it's, it, maybe it, there was a time in my life when it was my story. It's certainly going to be true of a lot of people around you. It's just this is not how it's supposed to work. And, and we're stuck. And we're stale and all the wheels have come off of what we thought life was supposed to be about. And this family, it, they've played out their future and there's nowhere to go. And, and barrenness is the way of human history. Hopelessness is what sin does. And so these people, it's not like they're not living, but they're just surviving. They're just hanging on. They're just on their treadmill uh, trying to keep going, trying to keep food on the table and trying to keep uh, head above water. And that's what sin does to the world. And the good news is that brokenness and barrenness is the story that God loves to speak into. Chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, Go out from your land, your relatives, your father's house, to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him. Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they'd accumulated, the people they'd acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land, uh, uh, the site of Shechem at the Oak of Moreh. At the time, the Philistines were in the land. God says, I'm going to give you this land. Uh, There are some people already living there. And it says, then the Lord appeared at Shechem. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring, I'll give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And from there, he moved on to the hill country east of Bethel, and he pitched a tent with Bethel on the west, Ai on the east. And he built an altar to the Lord there. And he called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram journeyed by stages to the Negev. All right, here we go. Into this broken world where there's nowhere to go, barrenness, hopelessness, lostness, God speaks. And I am so grateful to God in my life. He still speaks into such times. And what is more, what God says in these verses, it doesn't depend on what Abram and Sarai could do, what they brought to the table, because as we follow their lives, this is what you learn about them. They are quite without potential. There's nothing very exciting about this pair of people. They have all kinds of deficits, all kinds of fears. They're they're not these super giants at this point. God himself carries everything necessary to begin a new people in history who can work his will among a hopeless world. And he still does that in lives. So verse 1, the Lord said, And God's words uh, come, and there is calling, and there is assurance, and there are commands and promises in this uh, statement to Abram. 
And there are also images of resurrection in his words. And that's the part I, re I really love. We see so much of the gospel played out in these old stories. Because the New Testament will reach back, as, take these stories as illustrations of New Testament truths. This is one of those spots. He calls the dead to life. He calls dead things to life, dead journeys to life, dead families to life. No capacity for response. And he brings them to faith-filled obedience. Paul talked about, uh, Romans 4 is largely about Abraham and connecting dots back and forth. Is this man of faith, a family of faith, a nation that would be a nation of faith, fulfilling God's purpose and God's plan in the world. And He says, of the God of Abraham, Paul writes, the God, he is the God who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that do not exist. They were a people formed by God's word to bear God's promises, to do God's purposes. That's what the family of faith, that's what your family is intended to do. That's what we as a group of people following Jesus are called to do. And God's first word in the book of Genesis called the world into being. And this word called uh, the hopeless and the helpless into community with a future. God calls people who are stuck in life to get unstuck, to go on a journey, to go from where they were to where he wants them to be. And, and it's going to mean there's a departure from what is the norm, what is the predictable, what is the simple and the safe. And we have new life by faith. Jesus said, and Mark's gospel is recorded, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and the gospel, and the gospel will save it. What do you want to lose that you might gain everything? Well, here's the question. Do you really want to escape barrenness, brokenness? Well, there's a cost if you're going to do that. There, there's some things that you have to leave behind to go forward. That's always the case. God didn't say, Abram, here's the deal. Tomorrow, here's what tomorrow's going to be like. And a month from now, here's what it's going to feel like. And a year from now, here's how everything is going to be dramatically different. He, he, didn't, he didn't tell him all those things. He didn't guarantee all those things. He, but he did give a promise that I really appreciate. I will be with you. I, I'm asking you to go. I'm not telling you how it's all going to work out. But I'm, I'm going to do this with you. Back in Isaiah... Isaiah, 8th century B.C., you get, you get that beautiful image of the Jesus who will come, but also the God who was there in the 8th century B.C., Emmanuel. First time that word shows up, God with us. Matthew grabs it in the 1st century, as he's in the story of Jesus' birth, God has come. He is Emmanuel, God with us. That's how God does this. You don't have to do this by yourself. Abram, if you'll take this faith step and all those promises that, that come up in the first three verses, I'll make you, I'll bless you, I'll make your name great, I'll bless those who bless you, I'll curse those who curse you. It's also all a gift, right? It's all by grace. It's not because of anything they've done or will do. It's by grace. And God still gives. He, he's a God who gives good gifts. And this is a gift for him, for Abram, for his family, for his people, for the people of faith, for us. And for whatever reason, there are plenty of theological reasons we could dive into, but uh, God has chosen that we should relate to him, not how we want to, well, I, I'm going to give a lot of money, I'm going to make a sacrifice on an altar, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to jump through hoops, uh, do a two-finger handstand on a stack of dimes, I'm going you know, to figure out all the different ways that I can worship God. God says, here's how I want you to relate to me, by faith. This is how I want you to do it. This is how I have prescribed that this is going to work, and, and it's the only thing I'm going to respond to. And he chose a man, and he chose a family, and he chose a nation through which to reveal himself to the world. And he started with a guy who was just willing to believe, who was willing to faith. Verse 3 contains a calling, a commissioning from this community of faith. And one of the things that we get lost in, especially as we think about me and God, is that the story is always bigger than that. From the beginning to the end, it's always about more than me and God. As much as me and God is a blessing and the part I and I enjoy that part of it, he said, I'm gonna use you to bless the nations. 
is you can't, you can't be a, the person of faith and just be in your, your little Christian enclave, hidden away in your Christian storm shelter. Uh, just It's about me and my family and how that works for us. I've got to care about the whole world. You know why? Because I reflect the character of a God who cares about the whole world. So I have to care about my neighbors. I have to care about my community. I have to care about my nation. I have to care about the world, people far from God, people close to God, and everybody in between. I've I got to care about the whole world because that's the mission of the people of faith. Paul was speaking to the Galatians, and he said, Now the Scripture saw in advance that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. And proclaim the gospel ahead of time to Abraham. Abraham shows up a lot in the, uh, in the New Testament. That, that the gospel itself is wrapped up in all these Old Testament stories. It's not a, well, this is that, uh, that stuff that really doesn't matter. Now everything is, now we're in the New Testament. Now it all counts. It's all tied together. And that's why you, the best commentary on the New Testament is the Old Testament. And that's why we need to dig into it. In Luke's gospel, Jesus uh, refers, there's a woman, she's been crippled for a long time, and she puts her faith in him, and he heals her, and he says, she's a daughter of Abraham. He gets to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus repents of all the terrible stuff he's done, puts all his faith in Jesus, and what it says in the gospels is, Zacchaeus is a son of Abraham. They're a, son, they're a daughter of Abraham, a son of Abraham, not because of biological genetic code. They are those things because they're people of faith. They have now joined the people of faith journey, and that's why Jesus describes them in such a glorious way. In verse 4, it just says Abraham went. He believed the promise. He obeyed, no questions. He formed a family to embrace the call, to believe the promise, and that's what disciples do. Peter told Jesus, look, we, we've left everything and followed you. Well, that's what disciples do. They just go where Jesus goes, and they follow Jesus, and they obey Jesus, and they serve Jesus. Now, we get a new revelation in verse 4, and it's this image of a journey. And don't miss this part. It's a way of characterizing the life of faith, and it rubs against us in every imaginable way because the life of faith means you're going somewhere. It's a journey. It's always a journey. It's always from point A to point B. It's always moving beyond where you are to another thing. And that's why it is a literal illustration with the story of Abraham, this faith journey. And I know this week, it's, it's the, we, we've been remembering 9-11 all week and how it marked us as a nation. But one of the ways it marked us as a nation as the people of God in this nation is it made us elevate the priority of I want to be safe I want to be secure I want to, everything locked down locked away and predictable in my life and that's not what faith looks like we, we retreated from a lost world retreated from obedience to God's, God's clear voice throughout the scriptures to go to make disciples to care about people far from God here and near to the ends of the earth and it's, uh, it's made us uh, less than faithers. Somewhere, if you're living by faith, you're taking a next step in a direction. That's what faith is. I've had this conversation a nauseating number of times, of course, in my life. People say, well, I am, man, I am living by faith. Tell me about it. Tell me your story. Well, I, I'm involved in this Bible study, and I'm involved in this Bible study, and uh, and I love my Sunday school class, and we get in there and we study the Bible. I'm listening to a dozen sermons a week. So far, you haven't told me anything that is by faith. It doesn't take any faith to sit and soak and listen. It doesn't take any faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Don't forget that part of the story in the Bible. But we think that, that warming a pew and, and enjoying uh, just parking on a padded pew on our blessed assurance is God just doing handstands about that absolutely study the Bible I was in my Bible this morning not for sermon stuff for me and God stuff I'll be in the Bible tomorrow I'm always studying I'm always listening to other sermons reading books I'm going to pour into the study part but not so I can just sit and soak and sour but so that I can follow more effectively and following means something is changing. Something's moving. There's a journey taking place. And that's the image that 
over and over and over again Abraham gives to us in uh, the story of Matthew the Bible says Matthew telling his own story as Jesus went on from there he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the toll booth and he said to him follow me and he got up and followed him that's what it means to be a disciple that's what it means to have a relationship to God that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus you're going somewhere there's a journey there's a step that's beyond where you are right now that that's what it means to have a relationship to God you think about Matthew Matthew gave up more than any of the 12 disciples because this job he had was really lucrative he was making a lot of money he stepped away from more stuff and more security than any of the other disciples but he just left it behind he could have easily said Jesus I appreciate the invite and I will certainly take it under advisement but listen how about this what if next time you're in town just let me know because man I'll look for a front row seat to hear what you say I caught most of the Sermon on the Mount the other day that was awesome and next time you're in I would love to come and sit and soak and listen to you talk again but that's not what a disciple is a disciple is somebody who goes on a journey a disciple is someone who follows and says yes and he got up and he followed so here's Abraham Abram he obeyed God and by faith wherever God would lead him they take off okay how many of you love geography okay that's three good all right well get ready then I got a lovely picture up here for you uh, I'm on the stage and I can barely see them you're just going to have to believe me what those words say up there okay you see there's a solid red line then there's a, a dotted red line the dotted red line is a may have taken this route but what happens is they start down the land of Ur and that's what you get on the far bottom right that's the land of Ur the city of Ur Ur, Ur and then they head up they go about 700 miles to the north, they get to Haran. They're going to go about 700 more miles, they're going to get to what was modern-day Syria. They're going to run about 800 miles down to the Negev, which is where I stopped reading a moment ago. Egypt is just beyond there. And he's going to double back into the land of Canaan. So this is the journey that God has him on. But here, here's the deal about this. They start out as a family, and Abram's not even in charge of the thing here, but they start out in Ur, down there at the bottom. At the kind of top of that uh, little map, that's where uh, Haran is. That's where they stall out, where everything goes bad, where nothing is positive. And depending on the route they take, first Ur. Ur had about 100,000 residents when Abraham and his family are doing all this stuff. It's full of temples and palaces, incredible architecture, mosaics, it is a highly advanced civilization. They, they have access through a man-made canal to the Persian Gulf and the Indian Ocean. It's a, they are a way advanced culture, art, and, and so, uh, high levels of life going on in Ur. So they make the trek up to Haran. But see, if you're going to Haran, you see how uh, travel works, right? We talk about the Fertile Crescent. It goes from here to here. It's a crescent. Well, as a dad, you know, who likes to make good time on a vacation, that's a terrible plan, right? Why not just cut straight across? It would have been a lot shorter, except for one thing. There is no water cutting straight across because it's a desert. So you have to follow where the water is if you're going to travel. So they're going up what is known as the King's Highway. It's a, it's a royal highway, and they're following on this end the Tigris-Euphrates rivers, uh, Tigris-Euphrates big river systems, and that's why there can be life there, and that's why there have been great civilizations there for centuries and centuries, because there's water. You can't do anything without water. So depending on the route he took, he's going to go through ancient Babylon. Now, Babylon's not nearly what it's going to be in the uh, 8th century B.C., or 6th century B.C., but it's, pretty, it's a pretty important place. Uh, it, depending on the route he took, he could have gone through Nineveh. Nineveh pretty important place but not what it's going to be uh, later on uh, in the 8th century BC 8th century for Nineveh 6th century for Babylon but he's going to see some things advanced civilizations a whole lot bigger than anything he's, he's ever known Terah dies up in Haran then and Abraham gets this call to follow by faith so at that point he's still heading westward he's going to go from uh, Haran 
And as you go straight across, you're going to end up in Carchemish. Well, Carchemish, this is sort of on the edge of Syria, northern Syria today. And uh, Carchemish, it's big in, uh, in ancient history stuff because the Babylonians, they're coming, they're coming from down, uh, down here and they're coming over because they want Egypt, which is on the bottom left of your picture. Egypt is coming up because they don't want the Babylonians taking their stuff. And the battleground is this little narrow strip of land that's not surrounded by desert, but it has a Mediterranean Sea on one side and desert on the other side called the land of Canaan, or later the land of Israel. And it's important because it's what's in between. As with all real estate, location, location, location. And that's what makes it a battleground. Egypt is a power for a long time. Assyria, Babylon. So what happens is the, the, uh, the Egyptians come up. The Babylonians are coming over. King Josiah, one of the good kings of uh, Israel, he tries to stop the Egyptians from trampling through his property. He gets killed at Megiddo. Babylon, uh, the Egyptians come on up. They go head on with the Babylonians at Carchemish. And Egypt gets, gets knocked all to pieces. Babylon takes over the whole ancient Near East at that point. Carchemish is a key spot. Carchemish is a 250-acre city. Huge population. Super high walls to secure it. Again, art. Uh, political power. Marketplace power. Uh, Carchemish is a fascinating place. He's going to make his way on down to Aleppo. Now, Aleppo's been in the news a lot in recent days, right? Aleppo, once a beautiful, major, modern city, just wrecked by the war in Syria. And some of you have seen those pictures. There's been some, uh, a lot of pictures coming out of Aleppo. It's just heartbreaking. He goes on to Damascus. Damascus, also in Syria, but it's a, it's a city of power, warrior princes. You know what Damascus means? Sack full of blood. Man, you think the Chamber of Commerce would have said, you know, renaming's complicated when you've been around for a long time, but maybe we should consider a different name for a city. And finally, Abram and his entourage, they'd enter the land of Canaan, which, you know, it's what he's walking in the next uh, several, in, in these verses we just described, corresponds closely to the present boundaries of modern Israel. It's not very big, 50 miles wide at its widest, about 120 miles long. So this is not a huge nation. You think about how many stretches you can run like that in the state of Texas. It's not, uh, it's not a big place at all. But the condition of him taking this land of Canaan that God wants to give to him is you've got you to gotta walk it. Every place your foot steps, that's what I want to give you. So he needs to walk the whole thing. And he does. It's kind of like our prayer walking. We go out, you know, we have prayer walking teams that go out ahead of our team sharing the gospel. And you want to you step where you want prayers being answered. So we'll prayer walk a neighborhood before teams go out to share the gospel and to pray with folks in those neighborhoods. Same kind of idea. He's, he's, he's got to walk the whole thing. So he walks from one end to the other of uh, this land. And here's the thing about Abram. He's a unique guy. He has seen all this glory, all these amazing things. He's seen a, on, the, on the eastern side of this journey, he's passed uh, incredible ziggurats. Any of you enjoyed any ziggurat talk this morning? Ziggurats is like a terraced pyramid, like a layer cake, except squares, where there's a square here, and a little smaller, and a little smaller, and a little smaller, and a little smaller. It's a way to make a pyramid kind of building. And he, he's seen these amazing uh, things. And now he's in a country that's a whole lot more backward than that in all kinds of ways. He travels, but here's the thing about Abram. He knew one God. He was going to listen to one God. He was going to follow one God and have faith in only one God. But he's in a land again with lots of gods. And he has seen every imaginable God on this crazy journey he's been on. God has led him in a purposeful uh, trip to experience all these things. And so here's two places God that are specified that he stopped, and that's where we'll finish up. He stopped at Shechem. Shechem is basically the geographical center of the promised land. And he stops there, and it specifies that he stopped, and it was the Oaks of Moray. Well, this is a pagan shrine. And this 
big old tree must have been quite imposing because it's mentioned multiple times in the Bible. And what would happen is that the, the pagan religions, they'd come there and these uh, fortune tellers, they would, they would listen to the rustling of the leaves and the tree of the great oak of Moray and whatever the rustling of the leaves said, well, that was the word from the gods. And uh, it's a pagan shrine. And there, God stops Abram, and Abram builds an altar to his God. God speaks to him. He builds an altar to his God, and he worships his God in this land because this, this is going to be the place where God's name is known. This is going to be the place where my one God, not all these other gods, not anything you want truth to be, but this is how it's going to be with God's people. He didn't build a city, didn't build a monument. He built an altar to worship his God. Then he goes to Bethel. Now, Bethel's another long-time pagan shrine, and it will be a pagan shrine in the divided kingdom. It's the thing that really wrecks uh, what happens in the northern kingdom of Israel when the two kingdoms divide. Uh, there's a pagan shrine in Bethel. Well, there's, it's a pagan shrine in this context. And again, he built an altar. And I want you to notice the words. It says, he called upon the name of the Lord. He called upon the name of the Lord. And many of you, like me, you know, you pray before your meals probably. You know, you go out and eat, and you got your family, got your friends. And you say, hey, let's just say a quick prayer. And you kind of, you know, bow your head. You don't stand on the table and say, I am about to pray to my God who is in heaven and uh, thank him for my burrito. If you would like to join in, please, you know, I don't do that. You know, it freaks people out just to bow your head and quietly pray, much less that. But here's the deal. When he says he called on the name of the Lord, the words are very specific. He did not say in Bethel, in a pagan shrine, surrounded by pagan worshipers, Lord, I don't know how this is going to work out. Amen. But he declared the word of the Lord. It means he preached the word of the Lord. He wanted the name of his God to be famous in this land that God was entrusting to Abraham Incorporated, to this family of faith people who would develop more people of faith. He preached it and the locals heard it. He's surrounded, we learned, at Shechem by Canaanites. It means there's going to be opposition. There are going to be people who are against you, people who are going to make life difficult for you, not going to agree with you on all these things. But he says, I want God's name to be famous in this land. I want this to be a place of faith and worship. And the man of faith proclaimed the name of the Lord in the land. And the gospel is announced in advance. Here's, a, by the way, I can give you an outline of your program. Here's the outline you just finished. True faith believes the bare word of God. True faith steps out on God's word. True faith follows wherever God's word directs. True faith builds altars and worships wherever it goes. And true faith proclaims the name of the Lord. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please God. Not difficult, not problematic. It is impossible to please God. The Apostle Paul wrote that we walk by faith, not by sight. Jesus said all things are possible to those who believe, who have faith. So apparently faith is a pretty big deal to God. It means you're going on a journey with Him. You're taking a next step with Him. You're moving from where you've been. You're not staying stuck. You're not sitting and soaking, but you're moving somewhere. Faith is important to God. It is the currency of His kingdom. And the experience of the kingdom of God, His reign in our lives and in our world, depends on faith. And here's my question. What are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about that? We don't define this any way we want to, what a relationship to God looks like, what following Him looks like. He has defined it, and it's by faith. Or by grace are you saved through faith. And He was doing that kind of stuff with Abraham, and He's doing it with us. And what step will you take beyond stuck, beyond sane, beyond routine, beyond safe to say, I am a follower of a gloriously gracious God and I'm stepping out. Where are you going to step this week? Where are you going to go you haven't been? What are you going to do you haven't done? What are you going to put aside that you've been carrying as a, as a chain? I want to be chain breakers.